uh, he his teaching focuses on 20th century American poetry, but he's also published on uh, Bing Crosby and on Frank Sinatra, among other things, and writes with equal ease about these people and John Ashbery as well. And I'm, I'm very happy that he has joined me here. Well, thank you so much Anna, for, for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Um, Roald, I've been thinking about this wonderful new book um, as a kind of atlas, you know, a very personal atlas uh, uh, or travel diary. You take us on a tour of a number of places that have been very important to you over the years, places that have been particularly fed your, your creativity, your poetic imagination. Uh, but also some more abstract places or spaces like, like the DNA molecule. Um, I just want to point out for people who haven't actually seen the book yet that it's divided into seven sections, which is actually quite a lot for the book of poems. Uh, some sections contain just three or four poems, some more, um, and each has a title that reflects the setting or subject um, that those poems share. So in a way we are in motion throughout the book, we're moving from place to place, we're moving from topic to topic, and yet we are also pausing uh, within each of those places to sort of settle in and look around and you guide us through different facets of each of these places with um, you know, the sort of clusters of poems. Um, you know, despite these many sections and groupings and clusters, the book does not feel fragmented to me. So my first question uh, for you is, what are the constants? The book is called Constants of the Motion. What are the constants that hold these poems together for you? Are there ideas or feelings that underlie all of these varied uh, scenes and landscapes that you're taking us through? Yes. So the constants, uh, the constants of the motion a scientistic phrase out of physics introduced with a Wikipedia quotation. The constant is ultimately in the poem love and it is also my emotion through these places. You're right, Roger, there are three places especially, but then others come in, the three places are as far scattered as they can be. Uh, one is uh, a school of the crafts in Penland in North Carolina. Another one is in the Santa Cruz Mountains, an hour south of San Francisco. A third one is in the Luberon in Provence. Uh, they are places I went to, and yet in all of these places, I guess I'm the constant of the motion. And uh, the, I move through those places, I feel them. And as you'll see in the poems when we read them, I go back to my childhood also and uh, that terrible wartime which influenced things. Uh, maybe I can begin by reading some poems from, from the Penland part. Please, yes. So what, we're going to try something else too. Uh, on you people without telling you, we're going to project the text of the poems. But we're not too rigid about this. It's just an idea. Here is one, uh, for instance. And um, I, we will look at this poem and I will read it. And maybe at some point, since this is democracy, as will be demonstrated tomorrow, um, maybe you will take a vote on whether you want to see me or the poem yes. at some point. But let's begin with this poem, which comes from Penland. So Penland is a school of the crafts. Uh, they asked me there as a writer uh, some time ago, and I wrote a series of poems about the crafts. And I'm going to read two for you. One is about glass, obviously, and the second one's going to be about ceramics, because those are the things that I watched. Choice. Glass won't think. Red orange out of the furnace, its mass wrapped round a pipe, 
It cools a dark red fades, revives in the oven, sags a spell. I would be glass giving. The glass makers control. Into the fire, he says, out. He presses the glass with cork boards. Sparks fly, his tongues constrain. Glass plunged into water and ashes crackle, saved. I would be the glass maker. But who controls whom? Thought gone into feeling, into his hands. An arc swung and glass, only glass could. Stretches, sets, one curve gently nestled in another, near as we were to music. Not too hot, not too cold. Even tempered, annealed, disorder flows, blessing change in life's shape. Soon, when we meet, will you be glass maker or glass? That's the first poem. Second poem is about clay, and it's called Tectonics. And let's see if I can get the text here. Genesis, not God or Rabbi Low. Today it's just roll, squeezing a ball of clay, his small stake in creation. Did they begin this way, two thumps hesitant in clay? Yes, for now there is the other, a hole in the holy round. He remembers, he was six, June 1944, Five Jews walking out of hiding to the Russian lines. The fertile fields sodden in spring rains. No way but through the clay. His uncles are leaning on the women. His mother carries him. Take clay. A thing with magic begs to be understood. Kaolin and feldspar. Hydrated aluminum silicates layer like taking up water platelets sliding past each other, reversible to a point. This lesson may be of use, but who will do the kneading? Centrifugal. In a world of seductive tugs out, and not just at the wheel, all you can do is keep plastic balance and build by hand the higher shape within. A hand of clay is not the clay hand of a broken idol. It's a woman in Angola reaching out with a can of milk. It's the hands now too moving nervously of a man told his son is missing in Chechnya. Subtractive. So now this wet object faces me ample evidence for being far out of the Creator's League. But God was into salvage, I recall. And my teacher says there are tools, all those fingers, a grater, a curvy metal disc, and this slip slurry. Formation is as much a matter of taking off as adding on. My hands on the pot Remember, oh, how they reached out for yours, hand over hand, one summer day. Where people were, there are shards. There is clay on my hands. There is clay in my hair. It'll wash off, not the clay in my heart. Thank you, sir. Well, the what a, what a beautiful poem and um it's it's a it, it illustrates something important that i don't think i quite conveyed when i was describing the book which is that even though you linger on these individual places there are i mean the the memory of especially of um of your past of uh, the experiences you had in the 40s keeps coming back up in each of these places, they're all haunted in certain ways by memory and by the past, but also by your um, by your knowledge of, of science. I mean, the language in this poem begins to um, take us in that direction. Many other poems go much further, and we'll and we'll hear some of those later. I hope. Um, yes. 
I'm glad when I can get in the science and it's not too obtrusive. Uh, and in the same way, I will write about the past and those are the next poems I'm going to read to you, but they are, they are not the main subject of either my existence or of my poetry, uh, but they are me. And so they naturally come into the poems. Um, Roald, I know we talked uh, about the uh, the pros and cons of having the text projected versus just getting to see your face as you read the poem. And I'm wondering, are we going to read the gaze next? Is that yes. going to be a poem? Right. I wonder if that would be one where, um, I mean, I hesitate because I know it was hard getting the uh, screen sharing working, but but I would love to just. Let's see if we can do it. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. People, be patient with me. Um, uh, Bika, you can do both. If if people don't have the full screen, they can see your face and still see the poem. Which I that think is true. That is true. They can go on my face. Yeah. Do people know how to do this? How to go on my face alone? Uh, but I will. I have. I have gone out now of the screen sharing just to be not not to be distracting. Well, the other thing is that if we are only hearing you read the poem, then we're not able to anticipate it. We're experiencing it in a in a different, I think, more intimate way. So I, let, let's just try that, and then we can go back if if people want to. Yes. Listen, Tito. Thanks for the advice. I need you. <laughs> I, it, it was also that the you know the last sequ you know series you know. I could also see the chemistry behind it. And so it's at a, at a different level. Yes. I could almost see a battery in one of those. <laughs> this is my colleagues, Hector Abrunia, who is the best electrochemist in the world. And uh, I got him to say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's only I who can say that. <laughs> OK. But here I am at the beach. <laughs> yes, you are. You are. So. I'm back now in my childhood. And uh, this poem and the next are actually used in a play I've written about my mother and myself uh, and our survival in World War II. And this is, and some of those poems are based on direct memory. Some take off from something that was said. Uh, my mother used to say, we look death right in the eye. And uh, I, I built a poem around that. Uh, and that's what the gaze is that I'm about to read now. My mother says, every day we look death in the eye. She's proud of her English. Were you scared, mommy? Yes. And then she smiles, the rare smile of the sick. He looked away. I was there, but a child can't see. I imagine now my mother's, her brother's, and Nunya, I in the attic in our long evenings. For what if Duke's neighbors saw a light? There, death comes riding into small village noises, death with spats, holsters, a whip, breaking branches as he rides, working quietly his way through lists, ridding green earth of a worm in the eye. His roaming stops by Duke's school. Inside they hear hoofbeats that stop, death spots them, across two walls and they look him in the eye. And then death, boots, spurs and all, smells stale cabbage soup, which reminds him of the dead soiling themselves. He looks away fastidious death and comes back the next day. And the next poem, uh, so the, the word here, Duke, was the name of the Ukrainian family that saved us, hiding us at great risk 
to their lives, five people in the attic of a schoolhouse in the Ukraine. Uh, many Ukrainians did not behave as well, but the Duke saved us. The next poem is not based on real experience, as you'll see when I read it. It's called Rat Language. There is a woman trapped under a grate. She speaks to me calmly, asking for help. We must save her but move slowly for she's grown in there, grown to the shape of the sewer. Her bones must be bent. We can't just take her out. Her muscles must be massaged. Before we walked out in June 44, walked from the Dukes to the Russian lines, did they massage the men's legs, the stronger women? They were swollen. There was no place to walk in, in the storeroom where we hid, the bunker we dug out under it. We must lift her gently with oil poured round her. With a winch, there's time. Please talk to her. Ask her how she came to the sewer, why her children left her. Was there a time she could lift the grate? And Ask her what food people threw her way, where her patient came from, patients came from, and who else lived in the sewers, and did she learn rat language? Meanwhile, I'll get help. Thank you. Imagined, but in a way, realistic poem about what went on in those days. Uh, we'll come back, in fact, in, in one of the next poems to that wartime experience. I can't leave it, but as I told you, it's not my whole life. Are we moving to the Luberon now? Yes. Um, shall we go back to... Maybe we should. I think let's, let's let people experience both, both versions, uh, the purely oral and the oral visual version. Let's try. Um, if I can, can you people see it? Uh, not, not at the Can moment. you see a poem? Not yet. Hold on yet. Hold on. If the, if it gets to be, um, I haven't lost you. I'm just playing so to speak. One of these days, I will get it right. Good now, to see you so well. Can you see a poem? Yes. Okay. Now we'll make it larger. But we're seeing the one you, one you already read. I will. I will advance them. Do you see it larger? Yes. Okay. Black on Black. So this is a group of two poems from the Luberon, which is an inland region in Provence where 20 years ago, with the help of Crystal Woodward, a friend and a daughter of a chemist I worked with, uh, I created a retreat for myself for a month in the wrong season in Provence, which was the right season for a retreat, which was January because there are no tourists there. And in a cold jeet, uh, which took a week to warm up, uh, I had some time to write and, and to observe around. And here's a poem that starts out with something from the war, but ends up in Provence. But maybe that's not the entire story. Black on Black. In Krakow, the old Jewish town is manicured for tourists with Yiddish cafe signs, posters for Schindler's List sites. There are few tourists, but in an empty whitewashed synagogue, an endless tape plays a black and white movie, German footage of the move into Kashimir's ghetto in early 42, people pushing wheelbarrows, a well-dressed man in a horse-drawn carriage, 
trunks piled high, a cart carrying what looks to be a whole hut, the driver smiling, tipping his hat to the German officers who are in the film smiling too, streaming crowds, crowds alive, children watching an endless stream of furniture crammed into the house. And I think of the vineyard in Bonnieur on a newly carved out terrace along the stone wall, the white shells lie in clumps, some sunk into the earth, some piled into small hills, a mausoleum to themselves. I imagine the snails alive, moving to succor, moving at their own pace to the last wetness after a dry spell. Oh, so one could try to explain. Oh, so one wants to understand those traces of life still or moving, white on white, black on white. So we're in Provence, but the, the past never leaves us in this. But Provence itself was a very special place. It is a very special place. It is the cultivated land. You get the feeling when you stand there amidst the, um, the vineyards and the lavender and the truffles, uh, you get a feeling that people have lived there forever. And those terraces have a lot to tell us. Um, this is not the Provence of Nice and the shore. This is the inland cultivated land. And in this, I come to a theme, which I'll come back to in, at the end of the reading too, the cultivated land. One, a brown and reddish land walked in midwinter terrace by cherry terrace. Cherries were once were apricots here in straight yet undulating rows, guide wires, easing machine picking, past stone walls, stacked firewood past the rusty tangle of uprooted vines to the smoke of my cabin. Two, the sculptor sees a dead bird and from its contours a clay one lifts inward on a crooked single wing. He sketches a woman arthritic, woman's arthritic bend in a field, bakes chimeras, the hybrid animal, human, scream and jump. Don't begin abstract, says Evert, making what can never be. Three, the hand of animal man, hungry in reproducing, passes over this land, and the land contoured says, you have made me an IU, the tool maker per force, natural, but in me enzymes churn, half their sulfur atoms out of an acid plant, where, oh, where is common ground? I've walked fact, that factory, seen its plans, I've felt the workers' hands. Four, or shall we say it's all man-made? Bread as the vine grafted on American roots, all that earth delineated water channel, the hair shot in the morning, ground soaked with herbicide, water of the wild wind and the November snowstorm, the oak leaves, the jagged gall growth, the rose hips resistant, turn red to black. Five, it would have made sense to take the problem to the apparatus, to watch a needle swing and say, this is 68.4% natural, the rest. And Evert's clay bird. This is the cultivated land, the meeting ground of cherries. Oh, sorry, sorry. The meeting ground of cherries and the memory of apricots that were of wires and unsupported vines, of the winemaker steel tanks, trained dogs under oak trees stunted for truffles, the unromantic ground where lavender is a century old, where people were kind brand animals and killed each other for a creed where every stone terrace says, I intervene. Your mud is on my boots, so dear land. 
I listen to the land as I walk. It's distant dogs baying for me and cross cadences, the whine of a saw, a truck on a hill, crows talking, crowd talk back home. A horsefly is hell bent on the way in. I hear the logs spitting as the fire cools. Later, the evening wind in my ears, the mistral in the ears of the house. The branches of the one cherry to be pruned, cradle a plastic bottle, half full. It's waiting for the pruner for tomorrow. Evert. Evert is Evert Lindfors, a Swedish sculptor who, with his wife, converted a ruin in Lacoste. I was living between the towns of Lacoste and Bonnieu in the Luberon. He converted a ruin into a beautiful studio and house in Lacoste. And his sculpture is on the cover of this book, That Man Moving is a small sculpture by Avid Lindforsch, who's no longer alive, but he was a great sculptor. Roald, I can't help noticing that in both the Louvreau section and in the Penland section, you're drawn to the, mo to the sort of point where matter passes from a natural state to a, a made state. I mean, the act of making is so important to these poems about, which seem to be about landscape and about natural settings but it's that it's the way that things get shaped and 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 formed and pattern that you seem yes. most interested in the making of things whether it is uh poems or music or sculpture is a very important contact point of science and art let me put it as starkly as i can Poems do not grow on trees. I love what grows on trees, but art is made by human beings. And that is part of what this is about. And we have to come peace to peace with the earth in our making of that chemistry and of that art. So that's the Luberon and um, again, the science tries to sneak in but it doesn't succeed too well here in this poem. Um, that's just as well. But I should read a few science poems, right? Please, Roger? please. Yes, please. So perhaps you um, let me tell a story before the next one. Um, what happened was this. 1953 was the uh, invention or the delineation by Crick and Watson of the structure of DNA and with all its implications toward our time. In 2003 uh, was the 50th anniversary of the Watson and Crick paper. So nature asked me to write a poem for the 50th anniversary of the Watson and Crick paper. You mean Nature the Magazine, right? The ma not, sorry, not Mother Nature, nature the Magazine. <laughs> yes, Nature the Magazine, the leading scientific magazine. I was overjoyed. Very few people asked me to write a poem for anything. Um, and uh, here was Nature asking. So it turns out I had trouble a little writing the poem, and I wrote three, and I sent them uh, all of the three, and I'm going to read um, uh, two of them uh, to you um, of the three. The third one you'll find in a book. And I got a very nice uh, letter back saying this poem isn't quite what we expected. Well, um, as a poet and a writer, I am, uh, let me say, inured to rejection. Uh, and that is, it's okay, but the, I didn't expect this one since I was essentially commissioned to write the poem. That's okay. The other thing that appears in this poem is another Cornell figure right at the beginning, and that's Vladimir Nabokov. You will see that. 
and a little later is the town Swachov, where I was born, and a butterfly on torn up earth. And that is a reference to a poem by a remarkable poem by Inger Christensen, a, Davis, a Danish uh, writer. Uh, otherwise, um, let me read it. Oh, code memory, and there's a little preface about Alkman, they say, called her big-eyed. He was referring to memory, since we see the past by our thinking. And I was thinking about the memory encoded in DNA of the species. Walk in to a Ticino Alps wild strawberry midsummer. See the blues flit conjure up a young Russian with a net. Elsewhere by lamplight, one you loved can look at old photos and say, you smile like your father. He also wore a cap. The way lit up in 53, two young men just willing a model into being. Walk toward them, past the monk tending peas, on the stains, agar plates, and centrifuges. Come walk by the light of signals from within, past X-shaped diffraction patterns, on past 53, heady with the logic of splice and heel, the profligate wonder of polymerases into the nominable bounty, down this biochemical rope trick of a molecule, its rings sticky signpost tied to a backbone. Chain, 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 she sings. Run of sugars, unsweet and phosphine triads. There, there's memory's lair, the inexpungible trail of every enzyme that worked and those that did, but for a while, every affair the senses had with a niche. The genes turned off as we came out of water. What worked, what nearly killed the insinuating virus, code immured in soiled soft, in coiled softness, co-opted symbiotes, move for here, rig, wig, wiggling and collision gauge shape down necklaces of meaning interrupted by but stutters the uns offs intent a tinkerer's means to function that escapes us unto difference earthy life its dendro arms hazarding bury and you to the butterfly that lights on torn up earth in srebrenica and Zwachov that flies to the far place love obstinately chose an alp is to be climbed they did, our mid-century elixirs. But oh, an alp is also a sweet shoulder of a mountain, that meadow reaching for snow line, the place where men drive cattle, rest, move higher. An alp is clover, a place to feed and watch another blue. Now the morning glories winding grasp and climb. The word sings in alp and alkaline phosphatase and DNA in nuanced refrain, this side of memory of a world that was and one that will be. Lots of other things here. Uh, I'd like to have a word with those editors in nature. I, I, I think uh, they... Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they, they made a mistake. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't even get chain, chain, chain. <laughs> I wish I had Aretha sing it for them. <laughs> okay, uh, the next poem that we, uh, is called, which was one of the three I wrote, uh, was Sustainable Development. which was popular already in 1953, as a, in 2003, not in 1953. Alive, the vines just push the question aside, a green muff for these trees, coating them real tight like a cross-linked polymer gone mad. The problem in spring 
is the trees, are they? And will they be? Or will vine stop in symbiotic rhyme, leaving leaves an anodyne space, another shade to soak up dear protons from the sun? Or will it take no less than the molecular mojo, the shapeliest wrench insidiously bound in a groove in the vine's code hoarding anti-parallel inner twine? Upscale we, no time for evolution grip, cultures hand me downs, clothing and moods. Uh, for one, I would this vine grow to substitute bark. The twining attachment that may throttle starts innocently, yes, in spring, like the first gentle leaning of the creeper on the tree we think we have choice to cut in time. But this, like the dark green bee swarm, grows divine. Cultures hand me downs, clothing and moods. For one, I would this vine grow to substitute. Oh, I've read it. That's it. I've, I've read the last verse was repeated. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> Forgive me, people. I'm, I, but this, like a dark green bee swarm, grows divine. Yes. I was about to read. That was going to be an encore. <laughs> ignore the, yeah, ignore that fourth <laughs> column. That's just a, a stutter. Yes, I was trying out different font styles for pasting this, which took a little. I let, Roald, I love the way that the, uh, all the hyphenated words seem to evoke that sort of spiraling movement of the vine and the, the DNA yes. molecule. That's, uh, I wanted, that's what I wanted. Uh, Can I ask, um, I know we had talked about this earlier, um, you know, the, fa the way, the ease with which you incorporate the language of science in these two poems, is that, something you learned at all from um, Archie Ammons by any chance or uh, you come to that on your own? He, he gave me the courage to try it. Uh, and I've mentioned to you the poem, Him, early on, which has microscopes and telescopes. And uh, so, and then I saw in other poems from Archie that it was okay to use hard words, uh, long words, and it was, a re it was a challenge to get them in. There aren't any particularly long words here uh, in this one, but, um, but yes, I did get the courage from Archie to try it, and I learned it. The other piece of courage I got was to, to break a line on Creeper <laughs> or whatever it was. And also the other great thing about Archie Ammons was that I learned was how much is to be gained from walking the hard edge of syntax. And what I mean is if there is some ambiguity uh, in, generated by the syntax, that's okay. It has, it has a certain power in the poem from that ambiguity. And uh, yeah, I did learn a lot from him. Where are, we, where are we going next? We are going to read the one Japanese poem in this series with a story behind it. Um, let's see if I can. Yes, so here's the story and we are, we are getting, uh, no, we're going to skip this poem, Roger, because I want to get the last two and that's and to leave a little time. So we're going to come, there is a group of three Japanese poems, but I'll tell you the story behind them so you can read the poems, okay? So the story is a story uh, that I heard in Japan built out of uh, a struggle once between Buddhism and um, native religions and there was a Buddhist ascetic uh, and he could, he conquered a native god of the Shinto religion, a mountain god, Hitokoto Nushi. And that god who 
was commanded to, to build, uh, or rather the ascetic was commanded to build a bridge between Nara and between Katsugari and Yoshino. And he built the bridge telling the God to do the work for him, this angry mountain God. But they say, and there was just one sentence in the story, which is 1000 years old. And that is that the mountain God moved the stones to build the bridge only in the dark of the night, lest he scare the people. And I said, what is going on here? The purpose of a god, if you've seen a guardian of a Japanese temple, is to look terrible. It is to scare people. Why is this god not wanting to scare people? And that's what made for three poems that you can read in there about this. But I want to read in the last section some poems from the Santa Cruz Mountains in a beautiful artist colony I went to called the Jurassic Resident Arts Programs Drop. Shall I do that? Oh, yes, please. Absolutely. Yes. So first, um, just so you don't think that I only write um, um, tragic poems, uh, here is something coming from that setting of the Jurassic Residence Art Program. It's called Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. A brain is lying on the ranch road. Dr. X, it says, in a quiet Southern voice. I look around to see if anyone else is there, but it sure looks like the same dirt road I've hiked before. So I squat down to hear it better and I have to confess to see if it's growing out of the ground. Dr. X, it asks, I'm not Dr. X brain. Oh, I'm so happy you aren't. This is getting more complicated by the minute, but hey, it's California. I take a stab. Are you from his lab? No, well, yes, frankly, I escaped. The brain says, real matter of fact. Can't think of any Dr. X, so who knows what Stanford's artificial intelligence lab is up to. I sneak in a look at those hemispheres. Didn't recall they split so much. Brain, you don't seem to have your life support system along. I worry the wind is picking up in the brain Well, it's moist looking as I imagine brains ought to be. And sitting there among the chamomiles it's not quite your sterile environment. Yes, I had to leave in a hurry. This sounds like one cool brain. I can't see you. There was no time to take the eyes I'm hooked up to. I try to visualize Dr. X's lab, but what I say is I've never met a talking brain. You mean yours doesn't talk to you? Wow. Well, mine's a bit of a mess but you've met people who talk as if they didn't have a brain. I whistle while trying to figure this out. This brain has attitude. Listen, brain, I say, we've got to get you out of the roads. Some folks might just drive over you, no brain -er. Ha ha, the brain doesn't laugh. Well, doctor, roll, but you can call me poo. Roll, just pick me up with your Surgical gloves. Rain, this is a ranch. We ain't got no surgical gloves. Well, I wasn't going to pick the brain up with my hand, so I ripped two pages out of the notebook I carry for moments of inspiration, you know, and slip it or try under the brain. Easy does it, he says. Back at the ranch, the brain's a big hit with the artist. The talk drifts around to the left side, right side stuff on which the brain after a drink opines, as Hank says, my left side knows my right side's cheating heart. You're mixing metaphors, brain. Rolled, you are a bear of little, and I am the source of all metaphor. 
I try to get back at the brain, quoting what I just learned about the neocortex not being where emotions rise. Just then the power goes kaput. The next day the brain is gone, leaving on the counter a CD of John Cashy, Johnny Cash's greatest hits. That's it. Not much in there, right? Okay. Now, no, great fun. Uh, I want to read finally a poem which gets us back to another poem I read, The Cultivated Land, in which you saw me trying to get back to some balance between nature and human beings. And uh, that balance is important to me. And since uh, we have an inauguration and a new beginning coming up, maybe it's important for, for all of us. Um, so let me read the second growth. Let me tell you a little about the setting. That artist colony in the Santa Cruz mountains was next to various places where the redwoods had been cut to rebuild San Francisco after the earthquake and the fire. And uh, in particular, I was walking in a place, an, a state park called El Corte de Madera. And in there, the trees had been cut, but around them, there grew up fairy rings. Now we usually think of fairy rings in terms of some mushrooms growing around a tree, but this fairy ring was made up of little redwoods around that redwood and they had been allowed to grow for a hundred years. So they got pretty big. So that was pretty, that's the fairy ring. And there was a road in there and there was a road out, second growth. Everywhere, redwood stumps, El Corte de Madera, but not all trees served, the live oak and madrone they let be. And when the ground shook and San Francisco had to be rebuilt, they cut the sequoia, they cut clear the tree called Semperverance. 100 year old stumps still solid, tough wood, five feet above ground, the fellers cut notches for springboards where they stood with 12 foot saws. Teams of oxen laid their steam donkeys, their winches straining waited to pull the logs on skids uphill, in the air cursing, cracking whips and kerosene. Moss on every brown stump and live oak lichen on every rock and the concrete sculpture, ferns, cream bush and gooseberries grow in the shadows, a squirrel leaves neat sections of an acorn on a stump. A fairy ring, second growth, not of mushrooms up through needles, but now of hundred year old trees, what clones poking holes in the sky, gently hugging the stump. On the ground, the surprisingly small cones of redwoods echo the reddish brown of bark and burl, each cone a cathedral of spiky futures. A road is cut out of paradise, where this once time logging road was widened, with clay and loose stone washed down in spring. Last year, a redwood, its roots weakened, fell across where they cut it, I count. 150 rings, this road asks for care in its own second road. The road that you and I will travel is one that has been touched by Pacific mist, by people, the cultivated land, the stump cattle crossing, the hip rows, tenants in common, redwood and coyote, a poet cross paths, flinch and feed, tenants in perpetuity on a blue world. With Adam one and Adam two, the beginning was doubled. Bright, stark ingenuities given 
to the first Adam and Eve, tomorrow their brood will find microbes to feed on plastic bottles and caps floating in the North Pacific gyre and elsewhere turn them to roads past dominion. They will walk hand in hand with the children of those who till and tend of the second Adam needing Eve together. They build this road a road out of paradise for you and me does not stretch ahead and land alone. It flies with the hawk and plunges into every phosphorescent bay and down the dark deep underwater canyons. We will walk that road, you and I, dance down it in life samba like scuttling crabs, people, dear people and manzanita and machines aware of the one earth commingling strategies and wisdoms in slow fixes, earth healing at our touch. Let's hope. Thank you. Thank you, Will. That's just gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me, to everyone. The book is here. It has this fantastic sculpture by Avid Lindforsch on a cover. Uh, and you can get it in any of a number of places from the publisher, Dos Madres Press, from the Buffalo Street bookstore, and from some unnamed places on the web. Um, there it's available. Uh, and I thank Buffalo Street Books for the opportunity to read these. And Roger, thanks for doing this with me. Thank you. It's an honor. Um, do we have time for, I know that we're just about at the end of the hour, um, uh, but it's also customary to take a question or two if, if we can do that. I Isabella, will we be able to hear people or is... is uh, yeah, I think we can maybe have time for two or three questions if y'all want to put it in the chat uh, okay. or type them out in the chat yeah. and then uh, you should be able to see them. So I should look in the chat. Yeah, or I can I can look in the chat to see if any questions pop up and and then pretend to be thinking of them myself. Okay. Um, I see some friends. There are people from Australia. Hi. This is a great turnout. Not bad. Hi, Fang. Thanks for coming, Dan. Wish we could all just sort of uh, mingle over wine the way we I know. used to be able to do. I cannot access the chat. Oh no, I cannot. There's I see the chat, but I'm not seeing any questions, which may mean that people are either typing them or are just uh, so sated by your by your. Hi, Ingrid. There's several Ingrids. There's my daughter, and there's Ingrid Arneson. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. This has been such a privilege. Ah, Joni. Joni has a question. Poetry is a speculative instrument, an experiment. I know that you write poems to answer questions. Has what you learned from poems ever worked back into your chemistry, helped oh. you toward insights there? It's a great question. Have you, yes. have your science so, benefited from your poetry? Yeah, that's the science. I think it has in a number of ways, some of them pretty obvious. Um, uh, and that is, it has to do with the power of, of words um, and how short phrases and especially short sections and titles, uh, breaking up something into smaller pieces, conciseness helps. Uh, but uh, one thing that's the, the currency in poetry ultimately is its emotional impact. Um, and we are forbidden by two, 300 years of tradition plus the gatekeepers from injecting that into scientific writing. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, if you 
I learned this. I learned it as much from teaching introductory chemistry as I did from poetry. But if you can somehow get it past the gatekeepers, and I mean the editors of scientific journals, that's what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. But if you can get in a little bit of an emotional contact with the remote reader, that you care, in my case, I'm doing theory, so I'm explaining things, that if I can somehow get across that, that I care that the reader understands, uh, then I establish, uh, and I can, I've learned from poetry that you can do this with a word, with a single word sometimes, uh, or two words. You don't need much. Uh, and you certainly don't tell them, I want you to understand. Uh, but if you, you can do it sometimes by admitting ignorance or by admitting wonder, uh, something you make some emotional contact with the reader, uh, then you have their attention. Mainly they're starving for it in a scientific paper uh, and they don't get it. And I, if I can get that in, uh, sometimes it is in, a, in the title of an article. Uh, there are a few other places. So I have learned something from the poetry. Um, the conciseness is, is a bit of a, a problem because um, whereas economy of statement is valued in both art and in science, that an equation summarizes many things like E equals MC squared, and uh, that uh, something tells you succinctly a truth is valued in poetry and visual arts. Um, on the other hand, wh what I'm, since I'm into the business of explaining things, I use rather the strategies I learned in introductory chemistry teaching, which often involve repetition. It's not the hard hunt. It's not the argument of the hunting of the snark, uh, but it's if I say something several times, there is more of a chance that the students will understand. That's what I'm talking about. But that saying something a few times is a little counter poetry, or at least you have to say it in a different way. Um, so that both poems have refrains. Yes, so I should write songs. I'm not too good at it. Uh, we have, I think one, uh, maybe we can get this one last question in uh, from, I, I'm not sure I'll say the name right, Vida Stiebelman. Who are your favorite living poets? Always a- Well, um, I, most of my favorite poets are no longer alive, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't mean anything. It's just my, uh, perhaps I, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, read enough. I, I can't uh, name any living poets that I can think of. Uh, that I, 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 of course, was influenced much by Wallace Stevens and Archie Ammons in their time and Archie's name was mentioned. I like the poems in our little poetry group that has reformed, some of whose members are here. Corey, as I see here, and Ingrid, and David Burak, and Ange, yeah. and Nancy. Uh, there are some people here who, and also, David Lehman and Roger Gilbert, uh, that we meet to read things for each other. And I really enjoy that. It's meant a lot to me. Well, I guess that, that can 
I can stand as the last word. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Roald, for this magnificent. Thank you for all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roald, and all the organizers. Thank you, big guy. <laughs> yes, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, and of course, Roald's book is available at Buffalo Street Books if you haven't yet picked up a copy. Thank you. All right, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Mine.